All right. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening, though I believe it's afternoon only in California. My name is Bernard Prusak, and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College. King's College is in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. This is a special event for us in two ways. So the first is that we're fortunate to host two distinguished and politically influential economists in Heather Boucher and Teresa Gilarducci. Thank you very much for joining us. And the second way in which this event is special it is, is that it's made possible through the generous support of Andrew Coco, King's College class of 2017. Andy is a former student of mine. As I recall, he took three courses with me, business ethics and an independent study, and I remember social and political philosophy four years ago. So thank you very much to Andy. He is a native of the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, and he now works at PwC in New York City. He's already a generous friend of King's College and of the McGowan Center. Let me give brief bios for both of our presenters. I could say a lot more than I will. Our principal speaker, Dr. Heather Boucher, is the president and CEO and co-founder of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, which was established in 2013. She is one of the nation's most influential voices on economic policy and a leading economist working on the intersection of economic inequality, growth, and public policy. Her books include Unbound, How in Economic Inequality Constricts Our Economy and What We Can Do About It, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2019, and Finding Time, The Economics of Work-Life Conflict, published by Harvard in 2016. Dr. Boucher also writes regularly for popular <coughs> media, including the New York Times and The Atlantic, and she makes frequent television appearances here on Zoom with King's College, and also on Bloomberg, Bloomberg, MSNBC, CNBC, and PBS. Finally, though I could say a lot more, she is a senior fellow at the Schwartz Center for Economic and Policy Analysis at the New School for Social Research, which is where she did her PhD. Dr. Boucher is known then to our respondent, Dr. Teresa Gilarducci, who joined the New School for Social Research as a professor of economics in 2008 after teaching at the University of Notre Dame for 25 years. Dr. Gilarducci is a labor economist whose work is dedicated to ensuring retirement security for American workers. She's also a friend of King's College where she gave our annual Labor Day lecture in person, if you can imagine that, back in the, the dark ages of 2014. She frequently testifies before the US Congress and serves as a media source about pensions labor, economics, and older workers. Currently, she's in California, where she's a visiting scholar at the University of Santa Cruz, California, where she recently taught a class on economic policies during the COVID-19 recession. I looked at that syllabus and it looks just fascinating. So just some nuts and bolts for me and then I disappear. So this event is being recorded and in a few days, I'll post the recording both on the King's College McGowan Center Facebook site and the McGowan Center's YouTube channel. If you happen to be able to unmute yourself, which I don't think you can do, please don't. If you happen to be able to turn on your video, also please don't do that. We'll do a Q&A through the chat. So if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, if you put your cursor toward the bottom of the page, you'll see this little bubble of sorts chat. All you do is click on that and then you can write your question in the chat. Send that question to me. I'll serve as the moderator, so you can only message me as I've set up the chat. And I'll do my best to make sure that your questions make it into the mix. So Teresa just disappeared. I'm going to disappear too. And Heather, take it away. Thank you very much. Wow, it's like Halloween here. People are just disappearing and then I'm just the only one left. Um, well, thank you so much, Bernard. And I'm excited to hear from you, Teresa. It's great to see you virtually, um, old friends. And thank you so much to King's College. Um, I really wish that I could be there in person, um, but you know, things as they are, here we are doing these things for, via Zoom. 
Um, and of course, grateful to um, Andy Coco for his contribution to today. And I hope that he watches the video and likes it, as I hope all of you who are joining us today um, appreciate my comments. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about uh, one of the books that I wrote that came out in October of 2019. Unbound, How Inequality Constricts Our Economy and What We Can Do About It. And I want to preface that with just a moment to tell you a little about why I wrote the book and also the relevance that the book has to today. As I noted, it came out a year ago and it's been remarkable to me how relevant so many of the themes that um, I and my fellow colleagues were working on before the crisis are in today's circumstances. So by way of background, uh, about seven years ago, I um, co-founded an organization called the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, where we seek to work to advance evidence-backed ideas and policies in pursuit of growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And we do this through a very unique institutional model, which is that we engage scholars all across the United States to investigate questions of whether and how economic inequality in all its forms affects economic growth and stability. And we do this through a variety of mechanisms, but primarily we, it, we do it through an open and competitive grant program um, that is uh, the call for proposals is announced each November. And then we you know, decide on the grants and give them out in January or in June, I'm sorry. And over the past seven cycles, we've given away about six and a half million dollars to over 250 scholars nationwide to investigate these questions about the role of inequality in our economy and in our society and what empirical research can tell us about uh, how all of this inequality affects different economic outcomes. And then what my team in Washington does is tries to make sense of that research and make it accessible and understandable to policymakers. And so the book that I want to talk about to you today is um, really a synthesis of what we've learned over the past seven years or six years when the book came out about these, um, the, the new understandings in economics about the role of inequality in understanding how the economy functions. And um, so, and I, I want to just pause for a moment and note that 2020 for me and for the people on my team at Equitable Growth has really underscored the ways that inequality has made our society and our economy much more fragile than it needs to be and more fragile than many of our economic competitors. And we can see this in the way that the virus has been um, much more potent in many ways in our country versus others. We can see this in the way that um, it has affected the economy and our inability to really contain both the virus and the economic damage um, in ways that um, our economic competitors have been able to do better than we have in many cases. And I think that one of the things that underscores for me is that uh, this, this, this way that inequality has left us fragile means that we really need to be thinking about a policy agenda that'll make our economy more resilient to shocks. If there's one thing that we know, it's that um, things coming down the pipeline due to climate change or other pandemics mean that our economy is likely to experience future shocks. Um, and so the fact that we are not resilient to them is something that we need to be deeply concerned about. So I hope that the book that I wrote last year and the work that we're doing at Equitable Growth can help shed some light on both understanding why we are more fragile, uh, what inequality does, and how we can make ourselves more resilient. So with that, um, let me just give you a bit of a roadmap about where I wanna go from here. I'm gonna just show a couple of slides to ground ourselves in some of the trends around inequality. I wanna talk for a couple minutes about what we're learning from the empirical evidence. And then I wanna talk for a few minutes about what we can do about it. And just to get right to the point, um, I always like to start talks with a spoiler alert in case you, you know, need to leave or you, know, you got other things to do. Um, and so the spoiler alert is that what we're learning when we look at the research and evidence is that inequality systemically obstructs, subverts, and distorts the pathways to growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And we see this through a variety of microeconomic studies that look at, that make the connection between these micro trends and these macroeconomic outcomes. And we know this because I would argue that economics has been undergoing 
um, a revolution in how we do economic research. The field has become so much more empirical. I mean, it used to be decades ago that the top journals had a lot of articles that were theoretical. Now, if you want to get published in the top journals in economics, it's almost all empirical work. And much of that empirical work is using innovative empirical techniques, new methods, um, big data or data that the researcher themselves has put together or natural experiments. So really a much more um, robust empirical approach to economics that shows us things on the edge of economics, things that, that weren't really in the core of what we had thought about how the economy works that are um, that because we have this data we're able to see um, the ways that inequality affects the economy and um, I would argue and I, I do argue in the book that what this means in terms of policy is that because we can see the ways that inequality has these systemic obstructions subversions and distortions what we need to do is to contain high-end inequality and provide counterweights to concentrated economic power. So our policy agenda needs to be about providing guardrails around economic inequality. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit more about this and then we can get into some of the nitty gritty details. So with that, I'm gonna take just a moment here to share my screen. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm getting so, I mean, I shouldn't speak too soon, but I'm getting pretty good at this Zoom thing. Okay, so it looks like um, you can, you should be able to see my screen over here. So uh, title of the talk. So let me go through some key data points here. So um, first, I wanna show you this first slide. And what we have here in this first slide is um, uh, looking at the income distribution of the United States over the time period from 1963 to 1979. And on the x-axis on the bottom bar, is um, people sort of lined up by income. So from lowest income to highest income. And on the y-axis is average annual income growth. And what you can see from this chart clearly is that um, you have this purple bar going across at about 1.7% um, of average national income growth. And then you can see the pre and post tax income growth of people across the income distribution. What you can see is that about two thirds of Americans over those two decades saw their income grow at about the average of the nation overall. And folks at the very top of the income distribution saw their incomes grow a little bit slower. And folks at the bottom saw their incomes grow a lot faster. So over the 60s and 70s, America was a country that was growing together. Now, I wanna fast forward. So the next chart I wanna show you looks at aggregate growth, aggregate national income growth. So this shows you that 1.7%, which is that horizontal bar in the previous chart, um, that average national income growth annually in the United States from 63 to 79 was 1.7. But in the period since then, from 1980 to 2016, growth has only been 1.3% on average. So um, growth has slowed. And I think that, you know, as we're approaching economic questions, this should be front and center. So if you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, you're thinking about economic questions or research questions, I encourage you to think of this as a core question that we need to understand both empirically and for policy. Why is growth slowed? What has changed since 1980 in our policy and in our economy that accounts for this? But then I'm going to show you the same chart as before, but for 1980 to 2016. And what we see is a dramatically different portrait across the US economy. Here, instead of two thirds of people experiencing average growth, you can see that only people in the top 10%, those folks above that high income, which is the 90th percentile, are seeing their growth at or above the average. Everyone else is seeing their income grow since 1980 below average. And if you're very wealthy, if you're at the, or very, have a very high income, if you're at the top of the income distribution, your income is growing much, much, much greater than, than the average. And if you're at the bottom, your income is growing much slower. So what this means is that average growth no longer tells us a story about what's happening all across America. And indeed, um, America is a country that has been literally growing apart. So the experience across our country, across our society has been very different. So what does this mean? Well, two things that I wanna um, point out. Oh, no, actually I don't have this chart. So let me just tell you, sorry, it's a little bit of a different slide deck. So let me just tell you rather than show you the two things that I, I want you to take away. 
So one thing that this means is that um, uh, as income inequality has become wider and wider, as the rungs of the ladder have become further and further apart, we've actually seen a decline in mobility. People are less likely to move up the income ladder. So much so that if you were born in the 1940s, you were 90%, uh, you had a 90% probability of out earning your parents when you became an adult and got into the labor market. But if you were born in the early 1980s, only about half of people are out earning their parents. That has a remarkable shift in a very short period of time. And scholars have found that the real reason why isn't the slower growth, but it's the higher inequality. Those rungs of the ladder become further and further apart. It's harder to move up. The second thing is that as we see income grow at the very top, it has been solidifying into much higher wealth inequality. So looking over the past few decades, you see those at the top of the income distribution are seeing their wealth grow and congeal. So wealth for the top wealth holders in the United States has increased about 300% since 1989. Well, if you look at the median, I think the average, the, the American in the middle of the distribution, their wealth is about the same today as it was in 1989, um, and perhaps a little bit lower because of the current uh, economic crisis, which has hit lower income families and lower wealth families more than higher. So alongside these trends in income, we're seeing wealth congeal, and we're seeing the systemic obstructions of people not being able to move up. And that's where economic research can really shed a light. What's happening? Why is it that we are seeing um, people being unable to move up? What, what can we learn from economic research? And so this is what we do at Equitable Growth. We've been funding scholars to investigate these questions. And I want to summarize the three things that we've learned. So I'm going to share my screen again. So, um, and I have to hit share. There we go. I'm going to get good at this. There we go. So. As I noted at the beginning, there are three ways that we see that inequality constricts economic growth. So first, it does so by obstructing the supply of people and ideas into the economy. And this slows productivity growth over time. There are so many wonderful research examples I could give you, but let me just give you one that I think is really emblematic of the kinds of things we're learning. So Raj Chetty and his colleagues wanted to understand uh, what creates an innovator. Now, we know from a lot of economic research that innovators, um, people that invent things, um, help drive uh, productivity and growth. Those new ideas that spark all these new inventions that create this vitality in our economy. But so how is it that we get these folks into our economy? Where do they come from? So they had data on everyone who had applied, has ever applied for or received a patent in the United States. And they um, paired that data with information about people's, um, people's experience as a child. So they paired it with their third grade test scores, especially, particularly in math, and what that child's family income looked like. So they have data on kids when they're in the third grade, what kind of family they came from, their test scores, and they're able to match that to their experience as an adult and whether or not they were able to apply for and receive a patent. And here's what they found. First, um, kids that do really well on math tests when they're in the third grade are much more likely to grow up and get a patent. And perhaps that makes sense, right? That kid that's good as math, maybe it's a tinker, maybe they grow up and become an engineer. Um, and it, you know, okay, that's logical. If you just look at the kids in the, in the group that did really well on those third grade math test scores, and you say, okay, well, so what were those kids like? What, are, you know, what, what happens to those kids? Does every kid that does really well on those tests grow up and get a patent? Well, here's what they found. They found that among those kids, the children from the highest income families were four times as likely to grow up and get a patent as the children from lower income families. And as it turns out, girls four times as likely, four, sorry, boys were four times as likely as girls uh, to grow up and get a patent. Again, just in that, that group of high scores. And then when they looked at it across race, they found a similar pattern. White children were four times as likely as black children to grow up and get a patent. And white children were eight times as likely as Hispanic children to grow up and get a patent. So what that tells us 
is that something happens in between third grade and um, uh, someone's experience in the labor market as an adult, where some kids are likely to get ahead and some aren't, even though they all have the same aptitude as a third grader. And so they call this paper the lost Einsteins because there's all of these kids that don't make it. And it's not just that our country has lost some uh, sort of generic Einsteins, it's the children from particular communities are not able to become inventors in our society. They're not able to find their right match. And that means that you know, kids from lower income families or girls or black children or Hispanic children who might invent different things than high income kids, white kids or boys, those kids don't have the opportunity to become inventors and our society and our economy lose out on the things that they would invent and their communities lose out on goods and services that might be more calibrated to their needs. So this is just one study that is emblematic of the ways that inequality systemically obstructs people from moving up. Now, there's a lot of different policy interventions that we can do to help kids, kids go from you know, that third grade aptitude to labor market experience. And I talk a lot about that in the book, but I just wanted to give you that one flavor of what we're learning. I wanna move on to the ways that uh, inequality systemically, sub, um, the next way, which is that, uh, that constricts growth. So the next is that inequality constricts growth by systemically subverting the institutions that manage the market making our political system ineffective and our markets dysfunctional. So what do I mean by this? Well, one of the things that we have seen in our economy over time is it's not just that we've seen this rise in income inequality, falling mobility, and a rise in wealth inequality and concentration of wealth. We've also seen an increase in concentration across firms in the United States. So that's another axis of inequality that's been growing over time. And I wanna pause on this for a moment because what we, um, what we learn when we think about um, the rise of economic concentration is that uh, as firms become more concentrated, they're able to take that concentration of their economic power and translate that into political and social power. So what we see, for example, is, and, and they're able to use that to subvert the way that the market works. So let me just give you an, an example. So um, think about um, the power of, you know, one of the tech companies, the platforms like Google or Facebook or Amazon, right? So Amazon, as this big retailer, is able to control, um, you know, who gets on their platform. They have all this information about all the firms trying to sell things. And there's a lot of evidence that they've been using that information about sellers on their platform to undercut those sellers as um, their competitors. So Amazon is now um, producing their own Amazon at, uh, generically branded products. And there's evidence that some of the ideas that they've gotten for those products are from firms that are selling on their platform. So that's not fair, right? If Amazon's the biggest retailer and I'm selling some sort of widget and um, I get on Amazon to sell it and then I find that Amazon is selling the pretty much what looks like the exact same thing, but for a lower price because they're a bigger player, then that's gonna put me out of business, which is exactly what you've seen. So that's a way that monopolies can use market power. And there's a lot of examples of that across our society and our economy. But there's other ways that concentrated firms use their power. And that is to keep wages, um, is to make it harder for workers to bargain over higher wages and to keep wages and benefits low. So here, one of the examples that I kind of think about a lot is that, you know, if you are a nurse in the United States and you're working in some community, um, and let's say there's four or five hospitals in your community that are all within driving distance that you could work at, it is now more likely than not that those hospitals are all owned by the same corporation. And so that means that you, as the ER nurse, don't have a lot of options where to work. Right, so let's say that you don't think that your ER is doing a good job in terms of patient health or safety. Or let's say that you got into an argument with your boss, you had a personality conflict and you got a bad review and you'd like to make a fresh start at a different hospital. Um, you know, reasonable things happen, right? 
um, well, you may not be able to find a hospital with better workplace conditions because they're all owned by the same corporation and they have the same standards. Or that HR file may follow you from firm to firm, meaning that you may be then sort of blacklisted and cut out from those employment opportunities. It also means that you have less power to bargain to say, oh, I'm going to go to that hospital on the other side of town to try to bargain for a higher wage when they're all owned by the same firm. So this is another way that we're seeing the concentration of economic power across firms be able to subvert the institutions that manage the market. Right. The United States was the leader um, a century ago in establishing antitrust regulations that um, were supposed to make it impossible for monopolies and oligopolies to exist. But over recent decades, since essentially the 1960s, um, in large part due to economists, uh, we changed the way that we enforced the antitrust laws so that we focused um, for the most part, just on prices, but not on whether or not there was an actual competition and certainly not on what it meant for workers. And that's left this state of affairs in our markets where you have these big firms that have this outsized power and can really keep small businesses out, keep competitors out and keep wages low. Honestly, this is one of the things that I'm most worried about in the aftermath of the pandemic is so many small businesses have had to close um, because of the pandemic. We had to close businesses for the health of us all, but without proper assistance from the federal government for them to weather through the pandemic, a lot of those small businesses are gonna have a hard time getting back up and running. And you've got a lot of cash stored in these big businesses that are probably gonna swoop in and buy out those small players. And that's really gonna change the face of the US economy for decades to come if we don't think about that now. So let me get to the third um, way that we see inequality constricting economic growth and stability. And that is that um, inequality distorts our macroeconomy through its effects on consumption and investment with both drags down and destabilizes short and long-term growth and economic output. Now, in terms of the consumption side, I think that's pretty straightforward, right? If you live in a world where, as those figures I showed you at the beginning, where um, the income is going primarily to those at the very, very top, and everyone else is seeing their income grow very slowly or not at all, or even fall, this was the case for those at the very bottom, then that affects what people buy. Um, and you know, to just sort of make this real, at Equitable Growth, we funded this study by this scholar named Xavier Yarabel. And he wanted to understand what the effects of inequality are on inflation. And what he found is that because of inequality, firms are now focusing more and more of their attention on high-end consumers rather than lowering consumers. And this has actually meant that inflation is now lower among those who are rich than among everyone else. So just to give you a concrete example, um, he looked at the case of, of beer, right? So right now, if you go, if you go to a liquor store, um, I guess in Pennsylvania, you call them a packy store. I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't remember a package store. At any rate, um, if you go and you wanna buy beer, there's gonna be all of these high-end beers, right? There's all this competition now in the micro brew sector where you can buy fancy, expensive, high-end beers. And um, while those beers are more expensive, the price increases for those higher end beers has actually been slow. Well, slower than for beers aimed at the sort of mass market lower end, where there's actually not been a lot of competition, not a lot of innovation, and where prices are actually rising faster because there's not new entrants coming in to serve that market. So with inequality, it's this distortion of where investment happens and how and what that means for macroeconomic indicators. We're also seeing evidence that that rise in economic concentration and the rise in wealth is, well, let's just focus on the rise in concentration. Um, the rise in concentration is actually um, leading to a decline in the rate of investment relative to profitability. Firms that don't have to compete because they're monopolist don't see the need to invest in new productivity enhancing investments because they can they, they already own the market. Um, and so that's bad for the United States in terms of our long term productivity and growth. So having given you a sense of the trends and the empirical research that shows the way that economic inequality systemically is constricting growth. Let me spend my last four minutes talking about policy recommendations. So 
the thing that I think is most important, um, as I said at the beginning, is that once we understand the ways that inequality affects growth, it becomes very clear that we have to contain it. And one of the ways that I think about this is that, you know, it used to be if you were doing economic policy in the 1970s, uh, you were looking at a society that was much more equal. And we had institutions that constrained inequality. We enforced antitrust policy differently. We had higher taxes on those at the top of the income ladder. We had unions. And we were making more public investments in our communities, in schools and the like, relative to our GDP. Um, and so uh, with higher inequality, you've also seen the demise of many of the institutions that have constrained inequality the demise of unions, the, the shift in how we enforce antitrust, the fall off in uh, tax, taxing at the very top of the income distribution, and lower public investment as a share of GDP. So I think that the, what we need to be doing is if we want to address this inequality and the systemic fragilities that it creates, is we need to find ways to contain inequality at the top and provide these counterweights to concentrated economic power. And the way you contain it is we need to rethink how we enforce our antitrust laws. We need to focus on making sure that there's room for entrepreneurship, for new ideas, for small players, and that we're taking into account the effect on workers and communities as we enforce antitrust. Our focus needs to be on ensuring that markets are competitive, not just ensuring that there isn't enough, uh, just a simple effect on prices. We need to go deeper. Second, we need to rethink how we tax. The 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act stripped the United States government of its ability to make investments that matter through tax cuts that go primarily to the top and have not led to faster or deeper investment. We were promised in 2017 by the current administration tax cuts that would deliver strong growth, bigger investment, and faster wage growth. Even before the pandemic, that was not happening. The tax cuts um, did not lead to higher rates of investment. Um, and while wages started to grow, that was the low unemployment and they weren't growing nearly as fast as they should have given the enormous stimulus that was pumped into the economy because of the tax cuts. And the tax cuts primarily because they went to the very top are economically inefficient. We need to fix that. We need to reconfigure how we tax capital how we think about things like allowing firms and individuals to park their money in overseas tax havens where they never pay taxes, and we need to raise the tax rate at the very top. Third, we need to um, make sure that we are providing counterweights to this kind of concentrated economic power. With the demise of unions, um, so many are left without any opportunity to hear their, to have their voice heard at work or to provide a public debate about what is happening at the top of the income distribution or what's happening across the income distribution. We actually have fewer people in unions today as the share of the U.S. population than we did as a share of the U.S. private sector workforce than we did before we made unions legal in the 1930s or the right to bargain collectively legal. So we need to shore that up. And I think there's a bunch of really good and interesting ideas out there. And then we need to make public investments in things like childcare and education and health. But all of those things are really hard to do. So I want to just end on one optimistic thing. They'd be fairly simple to do and won't cost a lot of money. And this will be the last thing that I'll show you before we can go to Teresa. So last couple of slides here. So at the very beginning, I showed you these um, charts that showed you um, average uh, national income growth. Well, that number, national income, is essentially akin to gross domestic product. We're gonna get new GDP data on Thursday, and that's how we measure the nation's output. And of course, output and income or flip sides, the concepts are essentially the, akin. So this chart shows you um, uh, annual national income growth, again, akin to GDP growth, going back to 1963. So you can see that the pace has slowed a little bit, but these are the kinds of numbers that we get from the Bureau of Economic Analysis every quarter. Again, the kinds of numbers we're gonna get on Thursday. And this shows you the aggregate. But if there's one thing that I hope has come through in my talk is that the aggregate doesn't mean anything anymore because of high inequality. So we've been working with folks at the Bureau of Economic Analysis to disaggregate growth. 
So this shows you what that same indicator looks like, what essentially GDP could look like if we showed the American people who got the, that income that comes from our, our economy growing. And as you can see, if you just look at the red and orange um, bars, that's the top 10% of the US population. They're getting a disproportionate. They're certainly not getting 10% of total national income growth. They're getting much more. And in fact, in some years, they're getting 75 to 90% of all of the income gains over a year are going to those at the very top. So if we changed our national conversation from aggregate output to whether or not that income growth went to people across the income distribution. I think some of these things that I've been talking to you today about the ways that economic inequality constricts growth would become uh, more embedded in our national economic discourse. And with that, I will hand it over to Teresa. Um, hello, thank you, Heather. Um, I do agree with you. My biggest fear is after the pandemic and after the recession, we're going to have more economic um, inequality because monopolies will be even stronger and the ability of employers to suppress wages and working conditions um, will be even greater. So the urgency of your message is um, couldn't be even greater um, because of only the last four years, but because of the recession. Now, I had a way to decide, I had lots of options to use my seven minutes after Heather's talk. Um, and I decided that the most effective way that I can help you all um, understand the really revolutionary things that Heather has done. She hasn't, um, she's not a radical. She's uncovered a consensus among a professional economist that must be given the light of day given our situation. So to help cement the lessons of her work, um, especially in this book, um, I've decided to tell you the story of Heather because it's a story about the way economists do work and come to a consensus that may give us a brand new deal if we have a chance to implement economic policies that will solve the problem of stagnant growth, because behind that is the problem of unprecedented and sometimes obscene inequality. So here I want to introduce Heather Boucher's and her evolution of her work. How did she develop this sharp thesis that you'll see in this really remarkable book that inequality impedes human economy and human progress? Um, she has this burning question uh, about how inequality is not a substitute for growth, but actually uh, it's, a, it's a, not a complement to growth, but a, an impediment to growth. Um, what she's done is not only do her own work, but she's created a research institute that's both a vacuum cleaner of all the work that economists are doing on this subject, and it's also a petri dish up to grow economic research on this, on this subject. She has mobilized in these um, last few years, hundreds of economists to focus and to explore the thesis that some inequality may be good, but too much can reverse and stifle the growth of human potential. I mean, the whole human potential, not just financial wealth. Because as we heard, it obstructs human growth it subverts human growth and inequality distorts the ties and relationships between us. So one clue to how Heather has developed this is 10 years, 10 years into her career, she was the forefront of feminist economics. And I'm gonna take a side um, trip to tell you what feminist economists, they're both male and female um, economists who have explored um, the rich consequences of having humans do a lot of valuable, economically valuable work that is never paid, this value of unpaid work, to explore that, to see how we can um, value it, measure it, was her agenda um, 10 years into her work. And that, that led to her first book, um, how, to, how to Balance um, the Work that Families Do That is Unseen and Unpaid For, and, and our, um, our, our economic, our measured work. 
But I think the hint of where she first developed um, this thesis was 13 years ago, before the last recession in 2007, when things looked pretty good, she found a dark side of this growing um, economy in 2007. She and her co-author, Christian Weller, pulled on the string of an anomalous fact that bankruptcy rates were way up, home foreclosures, default rates on loans, car loans and credit card loans had increased sharply, showing a great deal of household distress. But the average household indebtedness, the average, remember that um, takes into account the very rich and the very poor, it hardly went up at all. Household debt did not go up. So what caused all this distress that we saw in the bankruptcy courts and the failure rates and the home foreclosures, um, what caused that but the average indebtedness not going up as it had before? Well, they found that all this distress was happening at the bottom, that somehow averages, like average growth, like Heather showed in the first slide, didn't matter anymore to explain what was happening to, to working households. So pulling on that string, um, she looks at how the fact that we don't support childcare or we don't have year round school or we don't have pre-K um, kindergarten as a matter of right, we don't have access to healthcare as a matter of right. She writes her book um, before the Trump administration called Finding Time. Um, Harvard published that one as well, The Economics of the Work-Life Conflict. And it was a brilliant, careful examination of that other economy, that unpaid work um, economy. And she wrote this book, published by Harvard, while she was forming her multi-million dollar center and advising a presidential candidate. Now, in retrospect, as we look at this book and the book before it, one of the best things that might have come from the Trump administration is that Heather didn't go to the White House in fact, she kept on working on the work you're seeing now. So during the Trump administration with her second book, Heather Boucher focused like a laser, like a laser and organizing other economists to do the same, um, to look at how economic inequality affects economic policy. And so in the book after Piketty, the agenda for economics inequality, she assembled 22 economists really like a school of fish, focusing on the same issue that you see now in the book. And in 2019, as we um, heard today, in a book that really culminates the research she's done for seven years, um, and in a book that every educated person should have on their shelf, it's one of those reference books, um, and it was named one of the best economics books of the Financial Times, she has collected the data and the economics that shows you that inequality is not something that you have to accept in order to have economic growth, um, but in, in fact, it obstructs economic growth. It obstructs, it subverts, and it distorts human development. So it's a great literature review, and it's your reference guide to how economics is changing for the good. So what she has done is shown that one way that economies thrive when there's more equality is that it provides a welfare state. It provides public goods that helps redistribute taxes and transfers of income that help equalize and redistribute opportunity. So those kids that did so well in third grade math actually all get to grow up and provide patents. But we don't, we need an economy that allows that to happen, not just the top of, of and a fraction of those third graders who do so well in math um, to thrive. If they all thrive, those third graders, we all thrive. Now, the largest part of the welfare state are workers really paying each other um, to transfer money from current consumption to when they might need it um, later. Um, either taxing themselves so if they become disabled or old or need medical care, that they have a pool to um, draw on. And that's interesting, but we need a call to arms for a different kind of an arrangement where we tax the people at the top 
in order to provide the investments for the rest of us, investments in health and public education being the sources of the most payoff. Now, what inhibits us from touching that very top who Heather shown us have really gotten all the economic gains in the last 15, 20 years? What stops us from taxing them is not really their own power, but our own beliefs that they are deserving of that position and that wealth, that they have really constructed from themselves a narrative that they are the deserving rich. And what are the three characteristics that make a populist believe that the rich deserve what they have? Well, one aspect of their des dessert is that they have good character, that if you have the rich among you, they do important things for you. They endow libraries and museums and opera houses and public art, that they are decent role models. Um, they uplift the character of a society. But if they don't do that, and the book shows that they often do the opposite, then what you get is a society where the production is um, for them and not for the rest of us. And the beer example is a very good example, but the production of private yachts and more and more private yachts and airplanes and um, designer beer takes away from the production of a fuel efficient car or more um, and better public schools. So their production to meet their needs, um, even if some of us might trickle down it might trickle down to some of us in a, a free opera once in a while, really does distort the economy and distorts where our riches are. So their character or their tastes don't help the rest of us. The second characteristic of the rich that make the belief that they're deserving, um, that her book overturns, is that the rich actually need to be rich so they can provide more productivity. So they have the incentives to produce the patents and the wonderful um, inventions. But it turns out it doesn't. They use their riches not to invest in innovation. Monopolies use their riches to enrich their managers and owners so they can buy more private yachts. And if that money is not spent on schools and health, the economy underneath the very top really does wear away as we're seeing. And the last belief that helps the, um, the rich keep their position is that somehow they deserve, they merit their riches because they earned it. But what the book, book uncovers and what after Piketty uncovers is that much of where the rich got their money is by taking it away from workers, by suppressing their unions and by inheriting the money and by creating a financial institution, that means that the rate of return to their dollar is a lot higher than the rate of return um, to a worker's effort. So in closing, I want to emphasize that who you just heard from is someone who's created a one-person Salk Institute. Remember, Johanna Salk um, created the poli polio vaccine. It was a pressing issue to society and by assembling researchers and having their own and having his own innovation, they solve this worldwide problem. Heather Boucher has done the equivalent. Heather Boucher and the Center for Economic Growth has nurtured an intellectual project that is not unsimilar to searching for a vaccine against this gross inequality of wealth and income. She has de dedicated her work to undoing the constraints that unprecedented wealth um, has um, unprecedented, unprecedented inequality of wealth, income, and health inequality has created for human, um, um, human society. And she's done it with similar urgency and leadership. The bottom line is that what you have just heard, who you have just heard from is an, is an academic who, thank goodness, is not just at a university that her academic work has been done outside the university for a center for equitable growth that gathers up academics 
And she has done this with the persistence and vision of a true leader. So you have just heard from one of the most important members in, in our profession, in the economics profession. And I hope that you have just heard from who will be a key leader in the future of economic policy in this country. Thank you very much. Teresa, would you stay on camera? And Heather, I hope you can come back. Good, thank you, it was just gonna be me. So for Q&A, please uh, send questions through the chat, again, bottom of your Zoom screen. Thank you very much, both of you, for an excellent presentation and a really interesting response. So I have a few questions uh, so far. Um, the one of the questions, believe it or not, is, is more philosophical. So that's, that's my discipline. Um, and then I have some um, more economics uh, questions for you. So uh, way back in the 1970s, a very important philosopher named John Rawls argued uh, against inequality and for permitting some measure of, 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 excuse me, he argued against equality and for permitting some measure of of inequality. But he argued that whatever policies a just society would have would have to benefit the least well off. So that's a so called difference principle. So I have uh, two questions then, you know, from that for you, Heather. So um, is some inequality good for economic growth? That's question one. And then question two, what, what policies would you support in order to realize that ideal of benefiting the least well off? So Rawls's thinking was that if you allow inequality, that would lead to a greater pie, so greater economic growth. But again, he claimed you have to um, make sure that, that the least well off are always benefited. So is some inequality good? And then what policies would benefit the least well off while allowing what he claimed to be that good of some measure of inequality? Those are terrific questions. Um, and I wanna just thank Teresa. That was a very kind comment, set of comments. So thank you, Teresa. Um, uh, and just thank you, Bernard, for inviting me. This has been so much fun. Um, so the, the basic premise of that question is that, you know, is some inequality good for growth? Well. I mean, so economists have long argued that you need um, people to be able to amass enough capital to make investments. If I want to start a business, I need to have enough capital um, and economic security to be able to do that. And so that's a form of inequality. Um, you know, you th see things like if you're going to invest in farming, you need a big enough plot of land. So you have to have enough capital to buy the big enough plot of land and all the equipment to farm. I mean, so you can kind of like think about different examples, but farming, I think it's kind of, it's, it's, it's easy to understand. Um, but I think that what we are learning from the research and evidence is that as long as you've created a system where if I make more money than you, I'm able to keep more than you and to, to put in place rules that keep you out of the next iteration of the economy. So if you think of the economy as just a series of economic games, right, day over day, year over year, however, what, whatever time frame you want to think about it in, if, um, if what inequality does is, is, is it allows the person who wins each game to then start the next iteration with the most resources and be able to rig the rules so that they benefit them in the next iteration, then um, then a little bit more inequality isn't going to be so good for growth, right? So it's not, it's not that there's this sort of um, perfect answer to that question, but that, you that if you want to have some vibrancy, and if you believe in any way, shape, or form that human talent is normally distributed, that, um, that people are born with certain, with, you know, with all, everybody has like the things that they are born with, their talents, their, their, the skills that they can develop, and that part of what we as a human society are doing is, is allowing, we're cultivating those skills, we're teaching kids things, and then we're allowing people to do what makes the most sense for them as an adult, what makes the most sense economically and personally, if you believe that that isn't destined at birth, then you need to create that openness so that in the next iteration of the economy, I get to be 
um, you know, an investor in this kind of thing, or I get to be an engineer, or I get to be a really great chef, or, or, or whatever it is that my talents and skills say that I can be in, uh, in the economy. And the problem is, is that if you have a system where inequality is congealed, then you don't have that openness. And if you don't have that openness, the very vibrancy of our capitalist system collapses. Um, over time. And that's, so there's that tension there. So on the one hand, we think that capitalism gives people this incentive to make more money, but what really makes it great is that you make more money, but then you got to kind of give it up a little bit so that the next person can make more money. Because if you just make it and hold on to it, then pretty soon you're going to have, a, you're going to basically have an aristocracy, right? And I think that's the, that's the challenge. Um, and I think the second part of the question about what policies um, do we need to support the, le le the least well off, that is, again, kind of, that starts from the perception that, uh, that what's happening at the top isn't directly affecting them. If what's happening at the top is that folks are able to create rules that systemically keep people out, um, if, you know, if you live in a society that redlines so that um, uh, black people can't uh, move into neighborhoods with good schools that are safe and have good amenities, then, um, then your idea that you're just sort of helping the least well off isn't acknowledging that the actual problem is that those with wealth and power are making it impossible for black people to move into good neighborhoods. So is it that you need to give them a bit more or is it that you need to open up that opportunity and not allow those at the top to hoard opportunity? So I, I actually think that we've spent too much time um, uh, in the middle to late part of the 20th century focusing on the bottom and not enough time focusing on the top. They're both important. I'm just trying to adjust the conversation a little bit and say, hey, you've been kind of missing the big thing over here. This question might be along then the same lines. Would, would universal basic income help deal with the economic inequality you've been discussing? Or again, is that, is that not quite the focus that you would suggest? It's not the focus that I would suggest. Um, I have a bunch of a long list of practical questions about it. And with the plans that I've seen, um, I think that a lot of folks that need help and support actually need access to good public services. So I think that one of the things that, I mean, there's so much research um, that shows that one of the most important things we need to do is invest in early childhood. Those investments in the, um, from prenatal to age five are some of the most cost-effective, some of the most, more, most important for human potential. And they're, they can be expensive. Right, so uh, a basic income isn't going to isn't going to necessarily mean that every three year old is in a really awesome uh, pre K program. It's not going to mean that all little kids and their moms, when they're before they're born, have access to really great health care. Right, and some people are going to get unlucky. They're going to have more expensive health things. They might need a little bit of help in their education, um, and we're going to have to make that up. So I actually think that a, a universal basic income, it it flattens those differences and the real time when you need to make those investments, which we know is early in life. And newsflash, right? Most women have their first child before the age of 26, which means that they are earning the lowest wages that they're gonna earn during their whole career. And yet this is the time when they need to spend the most money investing in their kids. Like we think it's college, but actually we need to be making these investments early in life. Well, how are they, they can't save up for that. And even a 12,000, I mean, I've heard, you know, oh, we'll give a $12,000 a year UBI. That's not going to make up for the fact that what parents need is cheap, affordable, high quality childcare and universal pre-K and universal access to healthcare. And that later in life, you can save up for that. That's why we have this progressive tax system. As you make more money, you pay more money in. And then those folks earlier in life and at different moments in life can use it. So I think there's a lot of reasons that I think it doesn't work, but that's just one. I have a question about uh, taxes. So uh, let me see if I can formulate it well. Uh, is, is it better to raise taxes on, on you know, that top 10% or top 1% and repeal this 2017 law? Or is it better to reallocate taxes back to community projects? So that's the question as it's posed. I'm not sure what you can do with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, the problem with the 2017 tax cuts is that it was a boondoggle. 
um, that's a technical term for when you give money to people and it doesn't do anybody any good except just make them richer, but there's no economic, there wasn't the kind, it was not designed for growth. So we can make tax policy that is thoughtful, um, that is designed to spur investment and growth, and that's what we need to do. And then once we raise those taxes, because here's the thing, the United States now is collecting less in taxes um, as a share of GDP than we have in any time at any point over the last 50 years, sort of adjusted for the business cycle, because you know, in bad years, taxes are really low. But in general, we are at this incredibly low point. And yet we are and remain one of the richest countries the world has ever seen. We have these massive investments that we need to make, especially with the pandemic. And so if we fixed our tax system, we would be able to do those. Now, actually, I want to be very clear, because of low interest rates, Government can pretty much do whatever it wants right now anyway. We can deficit spend. That's also an incredibly smart thing to do. But um, I think actually taxing at the top helps fix the inequality problem. So it's a twofer. It doesn't just give you revenue to do the important things you need to do. It constrains inequality at the top end. Follow-up question uh, about taxes, and there are a few more, so I'll go as quickly as I can. Um, when you look at, at the national budget, so at, at the spending of the government in particular, uh, do you see wasteful spending that does not add economic value? So how, you know, if so, uh, what, what policies would you recommend to eliminate that wasteful spending and, and give rise to growth instead? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, uh... It's an interesting term, wasteful spending, because uh, I, I mean, I'm always, I'm always, I would love to sit down and talk with whoever asked the question about what their version of what that is and what my version of that is. So, for example, I think that one of the things that we don't spend enough on is basic research and development, right? Um, universities, one of the things that, you know, we've seen over the past few decades is a rise in student loan debt. Well, the rise in student loan debt is because we as a society are making um, fewer, or we're making less investments in higher education, so it's more expensive for students, especially I'm thinking about public colleges and universities. Um, and we're not making those investments in basic science that benefit our whole society. But maybe somebody else might think that was wasteful. Um, but I'm thinking about what's going to create that foundation for growth over the long term investments in basic health and education. These are incredibly important. But one thing that we've seen in recent decades in the United States is an increasing tendency to outsource um, really important government functions to private entities because they can supposedly do it more efficiently. The problem is that what we've done is that we've hollowed out many of the experts that used to work in government that were able to look at a problem, evaluate it, and then come up with really smart solutions. And we've, we've outsourced that to people that are not necessarily thinking about the public interest, and in many cases actually cost a lot more um, than what we used to do in terms of um, making these things public sector. So when we're thinking about wasteful, it is how are we laying the foundations for us to have a strong um, economy for decades to come? What investments do we need to make? How can we make sure that our civil society is protected, that our democratic rights are protected, and that our laws are enforced? Um, and that's the majority of what the federal government does and what government does. So I think that a lot of it is, uh, it's really about digging deep into what it is that we expect government to do. Thank you. I'm still working on this this Zoom thing. Oh, well, by the time we figure it out. <laughs> so far, I have a couple more questions from uh, people I know to be economists, and you can tell they're. Uh -oh. So you mentioned Heather that labor market power has been increasing, but that countervailing institutions such as unions have been in decline. Which of these factors do you think is more important in explaining the failure of wages to keep pace with productivity? And I can mm. that you know, that's such a great question. They, they work together, right? I mean, so we've been seeing over time that more and more of the gains of growth have been going to profits rather than labor. Um, we've been seeing, you know, as I talked about the rise in concentration, the decline in unions. So the, they, they, um, these trends have, have moved hand in hand. And one of the things that we've seen is 
alongside the economic inequality, we've seen this rise in political polarization and um, the use of uh, big money to, um, uh, to strip people of their ability to act in the public sphere on, uh, and particularly to join unions, right? So we've seen these um, examples all across the country of um, private groups embarking on these right to work campaigns to make it harder for unions to function and the like. Um, and so that is, uh, that goes hand in hand with the, with fewer of the gains of growth going to labor. Last question. So uh, what, what's your take? And I'll, I'll put this to Heather and Teresa, since Teresa, we've made you sit silently for so long. So what are your takes, I suppose, on um, advancing a so-called steady state economy in which the rate of growth does not increase and environmental damage or climate change is slowed? Does such a model allow for the type of resilience that's necessary for future challenges? So you began your talk by um, saying how we need to build resilience into our all too fragile economy. Teresa, do you want to take that first? Um, I, I don't know if Heather agrees with me, but the, um, the problem isn't um, growth or no growth at all. Um, the problem is the distribution of growth. And so I would never um, think of a sustainable economy or a, an economy that um, that will forestall uh, climate change is one that is just merely no growth. In fact, we need a lot of growth in the retrofit sector, sector and the clean energy sector. And we need a just transition from carbon to a clean energy that takes into account um, the workers we would leave behind if we just close the fracking and close the oil industry. So um, I think people are barking up the wrong tree to think that the, um, the, the answer to a, a, um, you know, arresting climate change is no growth. It's it's really a redistribution of growth. Um, Heather, what do you think? I I hundred percent agree. So here's a, a fact that I did not know until the pandemic. Um, I had did not realize until the pandemic that the share of workers in the United States in leisure and hospitality had recently outnumbered the number of workers in the United States in manufacturing. So yeah. I say that because. When you talk about growth, we have this sense of what that means, right? You say growth, and I think sometimes I think of like more plastic stuff that you can buy. Well, that's not actually good for the planet, and it's probably not good for me, and whatever. Let's not, I don't want to judge plastics, but um, you could have a lot of growth by people providing services for one another, right? You can invest in education and healthcare and massage therapy for everybody, right? One can imagine an economy that is not um, damaging to the climate, but that is also experiencing growth, right? But I think that Teresa, so one is to sort of like to reconfigure your mind a little bit and that with the demise, not with the demise, but with the, with the, with robots essentially, be, with the automation being able to produce a lot of things in the manufacturing side and the move to services, services can be much more sustainable than these sort of old industrial economy. And that's an opportunity that we should be thinking about and taking advantage of. But I 100% agree with Teresa that there is so much work to be done to green our economy. Um, so much work to be done to build new sources of power, solar panels, wind, windmills, all the things, um, and to uh, to move to this just transition and to and to create opportunities um, in that new economy. Uh, just because we've been doing it one way doesn't mean that we can't do it another way and still be able to have a safe and decent standard of living. You know, again, we live in one of the richest countries that the world has ever seen. There is so much potential here to make sure that we can put ourselves on a path of environmental sustainability and deliver for the American people. And not doing so, is a, it's a political choice, it's a moral choice, it's not about economics. Thank you very much. You've given us a lot to think about. King's College classes will be working through this video for months to come. So I really appreciate your time and thanks to all our non-video participants for joining us and for your really good and interesting questions, which again, opened up so much. So thank you. I look forward to seeing you both on TV sometime soon. <laughs> Let me just give a quick plug. There's one last McGowan Center event 
It happens on November 5th, and it's entitled the 2020 Post-Election Forum. I hope it will be post-election and not just post-election day, but we'll have to see on November 5th what we, what we know. That's at 12.30, Thursday, November 5th, the same space on Zoom, and you register in the same way through the McGowan Center site or through the link if you happen to have it. Thank you very much, both of you, and have a good evening. Good to see you. Stay Keep strong and healthy, both of you. Yeah, Bye. you too. Thank you yeah. both. Good to see you. Bye-bye.